everybody. I'd say I hope we'd have a few more in the audience at this stage, but let's see who we get in, and hopefully you'll all stay during the process of this session. Um, this is an exciting session. It's one I've been looking forward to all week, and there's lots of discussion right now about what is innovation, um, how do we use new technology, how do we accelerate on a variety of different topics, and I believe this session is going to bring some of the answers to those questions. My name is James Dalton. I'm the head of the Water and Land Management Program in IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And I'm happy to welcome you here for this session this afternoon. You're going to be asked at some point to move around into groups and you're going to have to roll your sleeves up a little bit because there's some tasks for you uh, to get engaged with, but I think you'll enjoy that and, uh, and a fantastic training process uh, at the same time from some um, experienced training assistants that we have uh, the ability to access. IUCN is a partner with uh, Nature Metrics, who is a collaborator on this session, and they're going to talk a lot about environmental DNA, but we collaborate them, with them on um, a program called eBioAtlas, and the, design, the process of that, the purpose of it, is to map the world's biodiversity using DNA from water samples. So if you can imagine that in conservation world, the process of collecting data is fairly laborious, and therefore has a certain cost to it, and a time cost in particular, and that's why things such as the red list of, in, of, uh, of species, which gives you an idea of, of conservation status, um, take so long to complete because you are constantly trying to find data and accessing data and training people in methodologies. What environmental DNA can do is accelerate that process dramatically to ensure that we can collect more information quicker and easier and far more cost effectively to allow us to fill those data gaps and from there use that knowledge in a different way. I don't want to tell you too much because I'm not the person with the, with the expertise. The real people are here in the room with us and I'd like to introduce Peter, Peter Kimberg. He's the head of sector for water at Nature Metrics and he's going to kick us off with his opening address. Peter. Carolina. How do I? Sorry. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us here. And for those online, um, thank you for joining us as well. And thank you for giving us the time to talk to you about this very exciting um, technology called eDNA. Um, my name is Peter Kimberg. Um, as James mentioned, I'm head of the water sector at Nature Metrics. I come from a consulting background. Um, so for 17 years, uh, for 17, the first 17 um, years of my career, I was the guy that you sent places to go and do biodiversity surveys, specifically surveys on fish and surveys on aquatic ecosystems. Um, most of that work was done for ESIA projects, um, some of them related to mining, some of them related to infrastructure projects, some of them related to energy projects and oil and gas projects. I'm here to give you a quick introduction on eDNA and on nature metrics, and then I'll be handing over to my colleague, Carolina. So a little bit about nature metrics. Just a technical, technical, um, just give me a moment. I've just clicked it, it's changed, but it hasn't. Sorry about that. Thank you, Carolina. Um, a little bit about Nature Metrics. Nature Metrics was founded in uh, 2014 by Dr. Kat Bruce, who you will be hearing a little bit about um, in a little while, together with a small group of scientists. 
And over, over um, from 2014 to now, the company's grown to 135 staff members. And we also have our own lab in Canada, recently, recently acquired as well. Our vision is to be the world's premier provider of biodiversity data and intelligence um, to support the management of nature-related risks and the pursuit of nature-positive outcomes. Today we are providing eDNA services in over, in over 80 countries and territories, including recently Antarctica as well. Um, we have a range of clients, including multinational corporations, governments. We've recently, um, we're currently working on a project with the um, government of Malawi, conservation organizations, water utilities, and Mrs. Smith from Port Isaac in North Cornwall, who wants to know what exactly is living in the pond in the bottom of her garden. So just a brief word on the context. As you know, business and, business and society need to measure biodiversity now more than ever. But biodiversity is complex and conventional biodiversity surveys are time consuming and expensive and sometimes miss some of what is, what, what is there. As I mentioned to you at the start, I come from a consulting background and the, for the biggest part of my career, I was sent to places such as that in order to conduct biodiversity surveys fish or um, amphibians, mammals. And I can tell you that conducting a survey in an environment such as this, such as that on the picture, is, can be quite challenging. Firstly, it's quite challenging to get to. To get to an environment like this, you will probably travel for a couple of days with a team of people. Um, in order to survey this river, you'll probably, need, you'll probably need a boat as well. So to get to a place like this in the first place is, is very challenging. You, it's, gonna take, it's gonna take some time. Um, in order to collect biodiversity in this place, you probably need to be there for a couple of days. In order to do a survey of a river that size, you probably and you'll probably need to come back, you know, for seasonal for seasonal. Um, so it, it all it all adds up to a huge expense. It takes time, and of course, there's also risk associated because in order to survey a river like this, you'd actually need to be inside the river. So you'd need to be in the water. So it's costly. It's time consuming and there's some health and safety risks associated with this as well. So new, new measurement tools are needed and eDNA um, based biomonitoring provides a new technique that can generate huge amounts of species data from the environment. It can answer a multitude of questions across a broad range of practical applications. So what exactly is eDNA? eDNA refers to the traces of DNA that animals leave behind in their environment through mucus, um, skin, skin cells that are shed, and also um, feces and urine. So as animals move through the, through the environment, as fish swim through the river, they leave traces of their environment, uh, traces of their DNA in the environment. Now that DNA can be gathered it can be identified, it can be sequenced, and we can identify the species that are present in, the, in that um, environment. eDNA remains viable in the water for a relatively short period of time, so it can provide information not, on, not only on a temporal, um, temporal scale, but also on a spatial scale as well. Usually when we talk about eDNA, we're talking about waterborne samples, so samples collected from water, but we are increasingly working on samples collected from other environments, particularly soil. But we are looking at airborne DNA as a potential source of, of harvesting DNA as well. So there are currently two types of eDNA analysis that we do. The first one is called qPCR, which is a single species assessment. So that is really where you want to know, do we have species X in this environment? And the data that is generate, generated is typically presence, absence of a particular species. So we're doing a lot of this at the moment already for invasive species. Um, the data can be generated. Um, the lab um, processing can happen pretty quickly, uh, generally about within 10 working days from collecting a water sample, you should know whether an invasive species is present in that environment or not. The other form of analysis that we do is called um, 
um, MBC or metabar coding analysis, and this is really where we tell you all the different species that are present in the, in the environment. So if you wanted, for instance, a list of all the fish species that are in the river, all the mammal species that are, that are, um, that are using, the, using that particular environment, including some of the mammals that are in the terrestrial environment, um, we can do that as well. The data from metabarcoding, let me, before I move on, let me add that the data from metabarcoding analysis is generally presented as relative abundance. So it's really the abundance of data or, or the abundance of DNA for, one, for that specific species in the sample that you've, that you've collected. It's not, the, not exactly the same thing as the actual abundance of, um, the actual abundance of organisms, but with increased replicates, um, you can actually start getting an idea of um, of actual abundances, but it does require a lot of additional sampling. So from each sample, you can generate um, different types of analysis. So with one single filter, sampling filter, you can collect, you can do an analysis on, um, you can do a single species analysis, so you can look and see, do I have um, a species, such an invasive species, such as the signal crayfish, in this environment, you can also then, with the same filter, do a number of other analyses. So you can then, for instance, also look at um, all the different fish species um, that are in that environment. And you can therefore generate a comprehensive set of data across um, a cross-section of biodiversity at a large spatial, spatial scale with very efficient sampling approach and at relatively low cost. A of data, which is collected, um, from this transformative approach is, is unprecedented. Um, we provide an end-to-end -end service um, for our clients from advice on sampling design so right at the start um, to instructions um, on how to use our simple, easy-to-use kits, logistical support, getting you the samples and getting the samples back to our lab again. Um, we have a full lab workflow in a specialist facility in Guildford in the um, United Kingdom. We provide data processing, statistical analysis, and reporting. Um, I, before I hand over to Carolina, I just want to mention um, the eBioAtlas project, which is really our um, flagship project um, on which we're working with um, IUCN. And our aim there is to raise $15 million which will allow us to collect and analyze 30,000 samples from freshwater ecosystems over the next three years. And that will enable us to create a global scaffold of data in an accessible, interoperable database. Our clients um, and academic institutions that we're working with um, are encouraged to submit their data, their own monitoring data into the, um, into the eBioAtlas program. Um, and the hope is that we can therefore create a, 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 a database which is con continuously growing and continuously, the data is continuously being updated and renewed. And this is essential um, in order to build a standardized global biodiversity database that can benefit people working um, on the ground. It can also benefit policymakers. Um, for example, if you're, if you're working on um, financial disclosures to the TNFD, for instance. And with that, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Carolina. Thank you, Peter. At Nature Metrics, we've analyzed water samples from clients working on a vast diversity of projects all over the world. We've mapped pink river dolphins and hundreds of other species in the Amazon rainforest. We've detected protected species in mining sites that have led to changes in management and mitigation plans, detected invasive and endangered species from eels, invasive salmon, crayfish and mussels in the UK and Europe, to sturgeon in North America, slender snout crocodiles in Asia, and the ever elusive pygmy hippos in Africa. All this has enabled efficient and effective allocation of resources to the conservation and control of biodiversity and these species. But these are only some of the many species that we have detected using eDNA across multiple environments all over the world. So the question remains, what else might eDNA find, or framing it slightly differently, 
what else might eDNA be used for? And what else do we have going on at Nature Metrics? I mentioned that we can look at biodiversity through multiple lenses, and this is what I mean. Everything I've just talked about is focused on species and largely on vertebrates. Certain species are important because of their conservation uh, status, economic importance, or specific threats they pose, like invasives. But in the same eDNA samples that contain all of this data, we can also unlock information on other species, um, communities of invertebrates and macroorganisms, microorganisms, that can tell us much more about the overall health of the ecosystem. So having said that, um, there's three projects that I want to share with you today and talk a little bit more about, and those are microbial source tracking, MST, um, AI and ML, artificial intelligence and machine learning driven restoration tracker, and infield detection of species. Microbial source tracking, or otherwise known as MST, is quickly becoming one of the most promising and advancing technologies being developed uh, at Nature Metrics. In all DNA samples, we can look at the bacterial communities, and a lot of the work that we're doing at the moment um, suggests that bacteria are much more powerful than invertebrates or vertebrates for understanding the broader impacts of human um, actions on our environments. We can use information gathered on bacterial communities to identify pollution sources and improve our understanding of what's happening at a landscape or catchment scale. For instance, we can tell the proportions of the bacterial community that are associated with human sewage uh, and different types of livestock, for example. This can help to trace the source of pollution um, so that regulators and asset managers um, can take effective action to improve the quality of water, for instance. It's like using forensics, but um, for species detection. Uh, we've actually already begun to pilot this technology with one of the largest water and sewerage companies in the UK. Um, Nature Metrics is working together with them and using MST to help this company understand the impact of raw sewage being released into rivers and watersheds. So this technology will have major implications for the water industry and potentially be a disruptive force um, in protecting rivers, watersheds, and wider ecologies. Imagine being able to figure out how to improve the ecological health of your water, soil, or habitats using species composition and computers. This is what we're aiming for with the restoration tracker currently in development in our R&D department. Our team at Nature Metrics is using uh, the AI and ML machine learning models to determine which groups of species are responsible for ecological functioning Uh, and mapping the patterns of specific communities of biodiversity to tell you whether your habitat is getting uh, healthier or more degraded. This is an example dashboard that we're currently prototyping with some large infrastructure organizations around the UK. Um, it's at present being developed on soil-based metrics, but we'll be able to input um, aquatic samples for freshwater or marine habitats once ready and commercially viable. Based on a target or goal of community species, we can monitor and even predict how certain changes in land management or treatment, say for instance, how land inputs, riparian or tree planting, or even changes in water infiltration or cycles will impact the current communities and overall ecological health. And this will tell you if you're getting closer to your target and ecological health goal or further away. Several studies show that combining metabarcoding with machine learning enables better classification than conventional morphology-based indexes. And this is something that can be done even in countries that don't have decades or centuries of detailed knowledge on aquatic ecology. Developing new models that use the vast amounts of eDNA data to learn what the broader community signature of a healthy river is and how this changes in a predictable way as it becomes degraded or improves. This is the future of eDNA and machine learning models. This information will also be able to advise land managers and organizations all over the world about the impacts of their actions on nature. Really powerful information. Last but not least is our exciting product we call infield species detection. We're all familiar, sadly, with the lateral flow COVID test that allows us to know if we have a high level of the viral load in our bodies in about 10 to 30 minutes. 
well, what if you could do this with biodiversity and target species? This very exciting technology is currently in our R&D pipeline and using an eDNA technology called CRISPR, we have created an ultra-sensitive in-field detection. CRISPR is an eDNA detector or a DNA detector able to hunt for specific DNA sequences in a complex environmental sample. We can pre-program it to detect the sequence of a specific eDNA of a species of interest. The advantages of this um, of infield detection are simplicity, speed of use, accuracy, sensitivity, and the potential to detect multiple species at once. We're currently seeking partners to help us develop this technology further for a wider range of species and environments, so if you would be willing to um, help us and participate, please do get in touch with Peter or I. For us, the most exciting thing about eDNA is that we can all do these simple things from the same samples hitting multiple goals for many different stakeholders based on a simple, single, cost-effective field sampling effort. What we are celebrating here today are the arenas where multi-stakeholder partnerships are starting to come together to realize these benefits, and our eBioAtlas program aims, aims to faci facilitate this all over the world. The team at Nature Metrics thinks big, and our goal is to make biodiversity measurement, whoops, and our goal is to make biodiversity measurement ubiquitous and allow for anyone anywhere in the world to understand and measure the natural world, including lakes, ponds, rivers, and seas. After all, as Peter Drucker once said, that which is measured can be improved. Thanks. Excellent. Great. Thank you very much, Karina. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, now we're going to move on to the next part of the session, which is to have the, the presentations and the practical case studies, starting with Alexander. Is that right? Yes, hello. Can you hear me? You can. Yes, please. Okay, super. Um, shall I share my screen or do you do? Uh, so I can start. Do you see it? All fine? All fine. Okay, perfect. So thanks for the invitation. Uh, my name is Alex Weigand. I'm the zoology curator at the National Natural History Museum in Luxembourg and former manager of the DN Aquanet cost action. Um, in my daily work at the moment, I'm addressing many invertebrate topics uh, using multiple uh, integrative taxonomic but also monitoring approaches together with ministries and other um, more national stakeholders. And um, I'm particularly eager to act at, as the, at the science policy interface. And as such, I was very, um, uh, was highly appreciating that the ICPDR, the International Commission for the Protection of the Danube River, invited me to act as the coordinator of eDNA based activities for the latest joint Danube survey. And the results of this I'm presenting today. Um, so the joint Danube survey, it's a program which is uh, happening each six years. Um, in the committee, there are 14 countries supervising and organizing the survey, uh, plus the European Commission, but also many other laboratories, which are not of national of a national umbrella, but of um, universities, museums, and other institutions. In 2019, 51 sampling sites have been investigated with the ultimate goal to harmonize the water framework monitoring activities in the Danubian countries. And as such, also with the aim to test novel methods, including DNA and eDNA based activities. And given the frame of this section and the session, I will now focus on only the, the red uh, eDNA part, uh, which we used, for example, to uh, investigate fish communities along the um, Danubian River and catchment. We also used it in a comparison to address macrozoobentos diversity. Um, compared to classical bulk samples, which are morphologically, but also um, analyzed by metabarcoding, and uh, also compared to preservation liquid analysis. So we use the DNA molecules in the ethanol um, where the bulk sample was stored in. 
Um, that diatoms, unfortunately, we only um, analyzed via brushed um, samples, and I wouldn't refer to them in a classical way as eDNA, but um, results are also available here for traditional and molecular uh, outcomes. And finally, we also investigated the myofauna or sediment communities by exploring uh, the eDNA of the sediments. Um, the rationals to integrate eDNA-based uh, approaches in the joint Danube Survey 4 was to assess as many different organism groups as possible down to species level, um, thereby also integrating um, difficult groups or juveniles, cryptic species, or indeterminable sexes, so in general groups where it's hard really to come to the species level or where no experts are available on a national or even um, yeah, continental scale. And also by using eDNA-based approaches or DNA-based approaches in general, the aim was to provide reproducible and comparable taxa lists, which you can imagine is of particular importance of a transboundary or international um, survey crossing more than uh, 18 or 19 countries. And finally, uh, eDNA should help to um, provide another line of evidence for the taxonomic uh, diversity of the biota um, being present in the Danubian catchment. Here you can see an overview map of all the 51 sampling sites covering more than 2,700 kilometers of the Danubian main channel, but also many um, tributaries of the Danube. Um, before we come to the eDNA results, uh, you can also imagine that it's quite difficult to install eDNA-based activities for the first time in such a big survey program. So we had a lot of pre-survey activities um, ongoing. So the first one is referring to logistics and coordination. So we had to um, develop uh, dedicated concepts for the collection, for the transportation, for the shipping and for the storage of eDNA samples because none of them were in place at this, this time in 2019. Uh, we also had to obtain collection permits, which was rather tricky at B and three national transboundary sites of the Danube because different countries have different regulations to obtain permits. And finally, we also had to make a compliance check for the Nagoya protocol because it was not yet ratified in all the countries participating or being part of the Danubian catchment. Then, uh, of course, we also had a lot of capacity building activities where we had dedicated training workshops for the different biological quality elements of diatoms and macrozoobentos or fish. And also an environmental DNA training school taking place in Bucharest, uh, where the participants were trained in the different sampling techniques, uh, general knowledge uh, of molecular or DNA-based activities, but also to address concerns and harmonize existing protocols for the application in the Danube. And finally, um, as you can imagine, a species can only be molecularly identified if a a freely accessible genetic resource is available in an open database. So we had to do a barcode reference library check for the different taxonomic groups uh, to be analyzed by means of eDNA. So this was done using the taxa lists of the Joint Danube Survey 3. And as you can see in the bottom line, uh, we had a rather well coverage of the taxa known from the previous survey um, with genetic references being present in the database, but not 100%, so no full completion. Um, so coming to the first results, the meta barcoding of fish eDNA samples, this was based on the 12S marker and using water samples. And uh, here you can see the distribution in relative abundance of sequence reads along the Danubian catchment from the, um, yeah, from the source to the delta. And uh, we find a very realistic pattern of longitudinal changes of Danubian fish communities. And those changes or the community itself are highly comparable to the results we obtained from electrofishing within the Joint Danube Survey 4, but also from previous um, samples and surveys. And we also have a very good detection of rare species, for example, the sterlet sturgeon here highlighted in the red box which is otherwise very difficult to um, detect by electrofishing. But uh, on the other side, we also had uh, wastewater signals of commercial fish, which were caught up by environmental DNA, 
where of course fishes were obtained in taxa lists which are not being present in the Danube but where the signal was coming in from the wastewater so from larger cities and their their wastewater um, second, we have the results of the macrozobentos, so the main results. This is based on 46 sites, the cytochrome C oxidase 1 marker. And as I said, um, the major goal here was a methodological comparison of bulk samples, preservation liquids, and environmental DNA. And what you can see here is a Venn diagram of the families detected along the Slovakian stretch of the Danube. So it's only families, not species. And you see the four different methods or um, sample types. So eDNA of the preservation liquid, ethanol, eDNA of water, the bulk sample, and of morphology. And what you can see is that first, the eDNA-based methods detect more species or families compared to traditional methods. But each of those methods has a very high proportion of exclusive taxa, which points to a rather complementary approach. Now, one could question why that. Um, so we have uh, multiple um, reasons for those discrepancies. We have a technical one, which is called primer bias. So we um, normally apply a single or very few pairs of um, genetic um, primers uh, to amplify the different communities in the water sample. And it can happen that some groups are not technically detected, although they are present. Then, of course, you can have failures due to synonyms, which is unlikely at family level, but it uh, happened rather um, frequently at um, species level. You can, of course, have misidentifications in databases or in morphological lists of the um, surveys. You have the gaps in the reference libraries, so when no DNA barcode references are available or not freely accessible. And of course, you have the natural variation between samples and sample types because those comparison was not done based on a very single sample, but based on the same sites taking different samples. Um, now, all those confusion. Uh, on the other side, we have a good thing to report because we find a very large congruence when we do the ecological status class assessment when comparing the presence and absence values of molecular data with the traditional abundance data of species uh, in the Water Framework Directive Monitoring. So this is something really nice to, to see and to have. Um, third, we have the results of the sediment communities from 44 sites and two different molecular markers. And at each site, three independent cores were taken. Um, technically, we have to say that many of the sequence reads were not related to metazoa, but to bacteria also because of co-amplification. But still, we found 261 uh, species or um, units identified to species level. Um, the communities of the three independent cores varied, and the communities were dominated by chironomids, oligohedes, rotifers, and mayflies. And in the community composition, we had many myofaunal organisms, which are normally not addressed. So a lot of additional valuable uh, taxonomic data, for example, 47 nematode species, which were detected by the 18S marker. And those nematode species we also use to calculate a molecular index called nemaspear. So it's the amount of nematode species at risk at a given location. And uh, this is normally used to um, calculate the ecological status class assessment of a site. And when doing this, uh, the results were also highly similar to traditional outcomes of sediment quality assessments. So the, the nematodes make a good um, game here. So what we have as general conclusions. Um, so we had a great increase in taxonomic resolution for multiple groups. Like for example, heterogeneous communities like invasive alien species or ne neglected organism groups like the myofauna, including nematodes, or difficult groups or developmental stages like chironomid larvae. Uh, we also had a good detection of hard to observe or um, really unknown or rare species. And the results were widely coherent uh, with traditional data, for example, for taxa lists, for community composition and shifts, and also for ecological class uh, status class assessment where we performed it. But on the other side, um, the signals we obtained um, have to be seen more catchment wide, uh, less spatially explicit. And uh, that's because we have traces of organisms which might blur the taxonomic inventories, which are not present at the site, but washed in or via gut content and so on. For example, the, the commercial fish from wastewater. And we also have no specimen-based abundance data, but 
alternative concepts exist for ecological status class app, um, calculations. For example, presence, absence might be sufficient. And we need, of course, an explicit training and knowledge transfer to be open-minded and yeah, knowledgeable for uh, application of EDMA-based methods. Um, yeah, with this, I want to thank um, all the different people, all the many people, even those which are not listed here, for all their involvement, commitment, and enthusiasm um, for yeah, performing the Joint Danube Survey 4, and I'm happy for, for answering questions. Excellent. Thanks very much, Alex. So actually, we're going to have to just move on, Alex, but please do stay online in case questions come up later on. Um, let's move on to Lenka, who's going to talk to us about the Orange Senku. Uh, you wouldn't have your presentation with it. It's not, it's not uploaded. Do you, do you have it on your... Sorry, give us a moment, guys. It's, uh, it's just not loading, right? Yeah, it's not loading. Yeah, yeah. Do you have an HDMI cable? Do you have an HDMI? It's on this. Okay, sure. You want to use this thing or? Let me, let me, well, you've got it already loaded here, so. Yeah, you do have HDMI. Can I do that? Is that okay? Okay. Sorry, guys, give us a sec. I have plugged in the HDMI cable, but unless can you, is it on that? I didn't see there yet. Okay. Sorry, that's not opening. I just plugged in the HDMI cable, but he says it is on here if you want to pull it up as well. From here, yeah. Do you wanna? Okay. Thanks, Linka. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll put, yeah, no problem, yeah. Thanks for your patience, guys. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm Linka Tamai. I come from a river basin in southern Africa, uh, which is shared by four countries. And uh, I'm just going to share a few slides uh, that summarize some of our small experience with uh, using the eDNA for the first time in our river system. Basically, to start by saying um, some of the work that you see here represented by ourselves is an adaptation of the work that uh, the Danube uh, through ICPDR are doing. Uh, we had the opportunity to visit them and learn about some of the issues of um, water quality, uh, pollution, and so on that they were grappling with. And then we thought that uh, because we also have pollution issues, we could uh, adapt some of the methodologies that they use. So ours is called JDS. Uh, you saw the JDS uh, for the Danube. Uh, and we have been doing this uh, exercise where we gather uh, at least one official from each of the four countries uh, to work together uh, to co conduct the sampling uh, at various sites along the river system, uh, do the analysis and reporting uh, which depict uh, the, the health of the river system, so to speak. It uh, helps us uh, to, um, um, to contribute to attaining some of the um, SDGs, uh, the global targets that the countries have set. Essentially for uh, this time around, which was 2021, our basin survey, which we do every five years, um, was uh, a, a number of uh, sites, uh, spread throughout the river basin, as you see, but um, we actually had uh, environmental DNA added to it. I think uh, 
nature matrix was involved uh, did you actually sponsor it or but anyway uh, there was a contribution that came from elsewhere uh, because the bulk of our project is financed by the global environment facility um, yes and i'm reading what what i was told uh, because uh, this was written by the specialists who, sp who, who are very good at edna uh, but um, the, 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 the main uh, part of our exercise was really to try to test uh, how suitable this methodology could be uh, in our context uh, based on all the uh, good uh, characteristics and features that have been described by the colleagues uh, uh, already, uh, the owners of, the, of uh, Nature Matrix or the, the, the gentleman, the lady who presented before me. Uh, in terms of the findings in our river system, um, there were many species that were found uh, through the ADNA, which uh, are hard to, to, to come by uh, because uh, the conventional methods that we have been using, you would have to physically uh, sample the fish and perhaps observe the birds and things like that. But uh, this time around using ADNA, uh, they could observe uh, a few more um, of these uh, organisms that uh, could not be observed otherwise. Uh, some of the uh, species they say, um, but then I'll, I'll make a remark regarding that later on, uh, um, how far we can go with uh, actually uh, isolating what, what type of uh, organism has been, uh, has been found. But they also reported some exotic species uh, which uh, we thought perhaps would be found in other areas there uh, and not where, where, where they were found. Now, in terms of lessons, which is really the purpose of my speaking today, uh, very briefly, uh, is that we feel that there is uh, major benefits we derive from this exercise. Uh, the fact that it's non-intrusive, as was uh, mentioned earlier on, uh, that it complements very well the conventional uh, ways of, uh, of doing sampling that we have been uh, applying throughout. It's relatively quick uh, and it's uh, quite inclusive in terms of what you can actually um, uh, 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 find. Uh, on the downside, on our side, which is not necessarily a global uh, challenge perhaps, uh, is that it could not pick up everything that uh, we felt conventional means uh, could, uh, could pick up. Uh, please don't ask me a difficult question here because I was not the one in the field. <laughs> but uh, I was also told that the resolution was, only, was, was very low, uh, which is why I was uh, uh, questioning the other slide or the other point about species. Uh, being mentioned in this uh, set of, uh, or in this presentation. Uh, but I was also told that uh, this is because we don't have much of a reference sequence in Southern Africa within the states, uh, which is Botswana, Lesotho, Namibia, and South Africa. Uh, therefore, we have a challenge there in terms of pinpointing uh, the kinds of organisms to a level of species and so on and so forth. Yes, uh, capacity is still limited, but if my colleagues in the, in the Danube are also saying capacity is an issue with them, it means hopefully we can all work together uh, to try to raise capacity. But we think that uh, probably in time, we can work on refining uh, this uh, procedure and the methodology for our river system. Uh, but for now, the other element about capacity really is about the capability of our area or our region to also do the analysis, uh, which will hopefully also bring down the cost. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Linka. Um, we need to just pull up the next slides. Uh, it's Cat's video, okay. Do you know, is it on here? They're on it? Okay. Excellent. So we're here from Cat and Nature Metrics. Okay, please, if you, you can roll that. Hi, my name is Dr. Cat Bruce, founder of Nature Metrics. 
Today I want to show you how eDNA data is already supporting conservation efforts in West Africa, and you'll hear some of this story through the voices of those who are closer to the work on the ground. I'm going to focus specifically on work in three countries, Sierra Leone, Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire. Across this region, eDNA is being used to survey and monitor biodiversity in national parks and key river catchments, with a wide variety of partners, including international and national conservation organisations, national and local governments, mining and hydropower companies, national park authorities and universities. In many cases, data and insights are being shared among different groups of stakeholders to address multiple conservation goals at the same time. Now, the first thing I want to acknowledge is actually one of the challenges of working in this part of the world, and that is that many species are not in the reference libraries. This is especially true for certain groups like fish, which just haven't been so well studied or documented in the past. So the eDNA data sets often look a bit like this, with lots of gaps where the species names should be. Now, each line is still a species. It's just that many can only be identified and named to family or genus level. So, for instance, the top line here represents a particular unnamed species within the family Bellonidae. Now, at Nature Metrics, we take the, the approach that no name is better than the wrong name. So we're quite conservative in this. However, as the reference libraries grow, and we've helped set up a new lab at the university in Cote d'Ivoire to help accelerate this, we can add the new names onto existing data. So many of these gaps will be filled in over time. And in the meantime, even without species names, we can still use the data to look at diversity patterns in these less well-known groups. For instance, you can see here three separate um, sampling efforts in the Bandama River in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, the points are color colored by the species richness of their fish. Uh, so the yellow points are the highest species richness, those have got 50 to 60 fish species per sample. And we can see that very consistently the same area of the river is shown as being the most species rich. And this really helps us build confidence in the patterns we see in the eDNA data because we're starting to see that it's replicable. And the black lines that you can see crossing the river about a third of the way down on each panel, that's where a new hydropower dam is under construction. And the impacts of it will continue to be monitored by eDNA, by the multi-stakeholder partnership um, that's come together around this project in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, and we'll be able to see whether the dam causes changes in the fish communities, even if we can't name all of the fish. But we can still name a lot of species in our data sets. And this is already having significant impact on conservation in the region. Take this survey of Thai National Park in Cote d'Ivoire, part of the same CEPF funded program um, the, as the last, um, the last project I showed you. Um, the initial baseline of the park has recorded a large number of threatened species. And actually this list really highlights that eDNA is not just about aquatic biodiversity, even though it's the water samples we're analyzing. So among the threatened species listed here, we do have aquatic ones. There's some fish. There's also things like the manatee. Um, and we've got semi-aquatic species like hippos and otters, but then also fully terrestrial ones, including big cats like the leopard. We've also got species that live up in the trees, several important species of monkey um, and fruit bats. We actually get a lot of data on bats from eDNA. We've also got two important species of reptiles, the African softshell turtle and the critically endangered slender snouted crocodile. Now eDNA is often said to perform poorly for reptiles and they are harder to detect, but we still get some really valuable data on them when we start using eDNA across the landscape. Meanwhile, Fauna and Flora International have trained up park rangers and community assistants to collect eDNA samples in Liberia. And they've used it to do things like confirming anecdotal reports of pygmy hippos in new areas. They've been able to allocate new conservation resource to those areas as a result of that confirmation. Um, and they're now rolling it out to monitor other focal species like pangolins elsewhere in Liberia. And while they're using the approach primarily to determine the distribution of these focal species, they're receiving data on the whole vertebrate fauna and using that in many different ways. Here's Shadrach Kowilliam from FFI Liberia explaining how this broader data is helping conservation efforts in Sapo National Park. This kit right here represents a game changer that will help to improve the efficiency of the way we do scientific research in terms of identifying the presence of species um, in areas that we work to be able to get an idea of the lesser known species that are sometimes missed by our more extensive solids. 
It's known as environmental DNA or eDNA and has allowed the conservationists to identify new endangered species they had previously not been aware of. Among them, the Jantings dica, a kind of antelope, and the Diana monkey. The conservationists explained the new DNA method to residents of the national park and shared their discoveries so far. They want to encourage a kind of ecological awareness. My hope for eDNA in the future is that this whole idea of using citizens, local community, to help to gather information will bring people closer to biodiversity and will help them to appreciate more and work to protecting and conserving our unique biodiversity. So as Shadrach mentions in the film, eDNA often turns up surprises, even for people who know the area as well. And one thing we're finding is that species aren't sticking to their known areas of occurrence. And this really underlines the data deficiency, even for vertebrates in areas like West Africa. This critically endangered killifish, for example, was previously recorded only in one small area of Liberia. That's the area shown in yellow on the map. We've detected it repeatedly in a number of locations outside this area. And if validated, this could lead to a downgrade in threat, threat status for the species. We're working together with IUCN on that. We've also got new country records. For example, the endangered Thai toad had been known to exist in areas on either side of Liberia, close to the border, but never in the country itself until now. And even mammals are throwing up surprises. The Nimba otter shrew has, sh has shown up in several locations outside its known area of occurrence. Of course, this is where working with multidisciplinary local expert teams comes in. The teams of experts on the ground are able to go out and search in the areas where eDNA suggests species are present so that they can ground validate those important detections. They can also then help to generate new reference databases for those species so that we can build further confidence in their detection and identification in eDNA samples going forwards. And it's important to do that for other closely related species too, so we know we can separate them reliably. And just within the last year, eDNA has started to be used to assess and monitor key biodiversity areas across Sierra Leone, working together with IUCN and CEPF, who are now familiar with the approach from using it elsewhere in the region. So across this area, we've seen a huge spread in the use of eDNA for biodiversity assessments, and its power is only increasing as those efforts become more joined up. By carrying out coordinated sampling campaigns and sharing data between parties, multiple conservation objectives can be met including inventorying of protected areas or establishing the evidence base for new ones, updating IUCN red list data, creating baselines for assessing the impacts of new developments, deciding where to spend specialist conservation teams so that resources can be used to best effect, and engaging with local communities um, on conservation and research activities. And with that, I'm going to say thank you to everyone who's contributed to this work. EDNA is not a silver bullet, but it is a game changer in the scale at which we can gather biodiversity data to inform conservation in tropical forests like, West, like in West Africa. Um, so I'm going to give the last word to Professor Alassane Utara from the University of Nanguya Bragur in Cote d'Ivoire. You might recognize Peter's voice asking him the question at the start. Thank you. Excellent. So thanks very much to Kat for her video there. Uh, we're next going to hear from uh, Professor Alassane Ouattara from the University of Nangui Abragua in Côte d'Ivoire. And this is based on an interview that Peter had with him on his viewpoints and perspectives on environmental DNA. So if you can run that video, please. And I've started my timer. So, no, stop that, stop, restart. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very honored to be interviewing um, Professor Alassane Watara from the University Nangui Abrugua in Abidjan. Um, Alassane, very welcome um, to sure. this interview, and it's very good to have you with us. Um, we have 10 minutes, so let's get started. My first question for you, Alassane, is please introduce yourself and explain how and when you were introduced to eDNA and nature metrics. Thank you for your question. I am Alassane Watara. I'm a professor at Nangi Abrogoa University in Abricost. And I am uh, the head of the laboratory of environment and uh, aquatic biology in my university. Over the last uh, 22 years, 
I have conducted uh, some research on freshwater, lagoon, and uh, marine ecosystem across uh, West Africa in relationship with different pressure like uh, pollution, habitat uh, degradation and fragmentation, overfishing, etc. Uh, recently, I have focused my research on environmental DNA approach to study uh, aquatic biodiversity, particularly fish and diatoms biodiversity. I was introduced to eDNA two years ago in early January 2020, when I was uh, working on uh, NEMBA project in Guinea. Uh, the project is uh, to assess the assessment of uh, fish biodiversity in NEMBA Mountains River. So the project was conducted by Gold and Associate Company for SMFG, uh, it is a mining uh, a company in Guinea. So the project has planned to use uh, eDNA techniques beside the classic method using Petro Fisher and GibNet techniques. Uh, at that time, uh, I have a friend of mine named Peter Kimber from Goldeck and Associate Company. Uh, he has shown me this new approach, how to use nature metrics kits on the fields for eDNA sampling. And uh, two weeks after our field work with my friend Peter, Peter put me in contact with uh, Benjamin Baka, uh, the West African coordinator of Nature Metrics company. And this is the beginning of uh, the collaboration with Nature Metrics. And uh, one month later, it was in February 2020, uh, my lab hosted a eDNA training workshop, and Benjamin Baka was the trainer. It was uh, a very good opportunity to meet uh, those uh, uh, people working in the environmental and research sector and explain, uh, let's say, uh, the more uh, about the work Nature Metrics is doing in eDNA. Yeah. Fantastic. Second question. Please tell us about any project you're working on with eDNA in your country at the moment. Uh, at the moment, let's say, in partnership with Nature Metrics, uh, we have a project uh, named uh, improving, improving Freshwater Biodiversity Conservation in Abricos using uh, DNA uh, uh, approach. This project was conducted uh, uh, in a big river named Bandama. Uh, we did it, uh, we started in January 2021. So now you are at the end of the project. So the project was uh, funded by CPF, uh, Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund. So this is uh, the first project we start with on eDNA. The second one, uh, it was uh, a project based on another big uh, river named Comwe, where you have the, the pressure of uh, illegal mining and agriculture activities, which had an impact on the water quality and on fish. So we did a eDNA approach there. And the last project, it was uh, the use of eDNA approach uh, in collaboration with colleagues across the world, because we want to study the diatoms, diversity, and biogeography across four continents, uh, Africa, Oceania, Europe, and America. This is the third uh, uh, project you, you, where you use eDNA. And as, as somebody who's done a lot of work con using conventional surveys, um, electrofishing, netting um, across West Africa, what are your thoughts on the benefits and advantages of, of eDNA? Ah, I can say uh, eDNA is welcome because uh, I can imagine the number of fish I have killed across West Africa during let's say 22 years. For me, uh, after our, our project in Côte d'Ivoire here, people have seen that this method could help to carry out, let's say, fish inventory, shrimps inventory, 
uh, so, and, 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 and so on, on a large scale in a minimum of time and cost without impacting fish, shrimps, and, and so on. So this is, I can't imagine, uh, let's say something, uh, when you can use it, let's say without a whole team and to have a good result. So for, for me, uh, the innovation, uh, this technique is an innovative technique for studying biodiversity and it's very, very, very useful. That sounds fantastic, Alison. The last thing I want to ask you about is Nature Metrics and your laboratory are currently working on a collaborative project um, where we are building capacity in your lab. Um, tell me more about that and the advantages of that. Uh, I'd love to greet Nature Metrics. Because uh, in our, during our partnerships, we got a project. We launched a project and we got some results. Right now, I'm very happy because we have a small lab, a eDNA lab with new equipment. Some researcher from Nature Metrics came on the ground here to build the capacity of researcher, technician, and student in my university. And they have planned to, uh, uh, to send one of my researchers on U in UK to reinforce his capacity. So I can say that I'm very, very grateful to Nature Metrics for its help. Well, thank you very much for your time, Alessand. We appreciate that. Um, and it's always a pleasure to talk to you, my friend. And we look forward I look forward to working with you in the future, and I'm sure um, the relationship between Nature Metrics and your lab in the Ivory Coast will continue to go from strength to strength. Thank you very much Thank for you your very time. Much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Refer to as the breakout session of our of our presentation this afternoon. Um, the structure of this is mainly going to be that we we're first going to um, play a short video for you that will demonstrate the um, how easy it is to use eDNA sampling kits. Um, if the face of this person um, up there looks familiar, if, if it looks like me, this is because this is my daughter Isla, who is eight years old, and um, her and her sister Ruby, who is six years old are going to start off um, by, sh by giving you a quick introduction to the practical application or the practical um, side of eDNA and how easy it is to sample eDNA. After that, um, we're going to follow that up with a question and answer session. Um, we find that whenever we talk about eDNA, there's normally lots of questions. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll have this video, then we're going to have a question and answer session. Um, before we hand it back over to James to make um, the concluding remarks and the conclusions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Isla Kimberg and I'm eight years old. Hi, I'm Ruby Kimberg and I'm six years old. And we're going to show you how easy it is to collect an eDNA sample. When working near water, it's important to stay safe and that includes filling out a risk assessment. Life jacket? Check. Contaminate your DNA samples with your own DNA. So first thing you, the first thing you do is get the sterile gloves from your sampling kit. Once you've got your gloves on, it's important not to contaminate them by touching your face, your hair, or engaging with any other monster business. Your sampling kit includes a sterile sam sample collection bag. Hold your bag in the stream in an upstream position and then let the water flow in. The bag is designed to stand on its own on the ground, but on e uneven surfaces it is mu it's sometimes best to put it in a bucket. Now we're going to start the pro 
process of filtration. For that, you will need the syringe and filter from your sampling kit. Fill the syringe up from, with water from your sampling bag. Screw the filter onto the syringe. Filter the water by, push, by pushing the foot. You might need to do this several times to filter to a minimum of 2 to 3 litres of water. After filtering the required amount of water, the next step is to get the water, all the water out from the filter. To do this, remove the filter from the syringe, so fill the syringe with air and screw the filter back on again. Hold the syringe pointing downwards and push the plunger. The next step is preservation. Sampling kit contains a pre-measured preservative solution. Unscrew the red cap off the, the preservative solution and then screw it onto the filter. Hold the syringe pointing upwards and, pour, and push the preservative solution into the filter. The solution bubbles out of the top of the the filter, the, screw the red cap back onto the filter. Holding it downward, unscrew off the syringe and put another red cap on this on the other end of the syringe. Make sure to write all the information on the sheet. Now put your sample data sheet and your to Nature Metrics for analysis. Sample collection in ponds or lakes might be a little bit different. If you want more information, contact Peter Kimberg or Carolina Pere at Nature Metrics. <laughs> Thank you, sorry, as you can hear, that was a very windy UK day normal day in the normal day in the in the in the UK um, we're now going to go over to um, a question and answer session um, so if there if there are any questions in the room or online then um, we going we're up here to answer them so um, we do have a microphone so um, we'll hand a microphone is there anybody does anybody have any questions off the off the off the at the start To set up a basic laboratory, um, because we don't have them, uh, what, what is the, the quantum of investment we are speaking about? That's a very good <laughs> question. <laughs> um, Le um, Lenka, to be honest with you, um, we would have to get back to you on that one. Um, we, have your, we have your email address and we can talk to you about that. Quite honestly, um, I, I, don't, I, don't have, I don't have the answer for that. Yes, sir. <coughs> oh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to call. But yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Joe Shuttleworth. I work at um, Arup in the UK. Um, re really great um, uh, presentations and stories from 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 from, from, from you know, about about what you've been doing. Do, do you do any work around um, sort of like human health markers? Uh, so things like. Uh, like communicable, like communicable uh, diseases around sort of viruses or antimicrobial resistance and things like that. No, the services that we um, the, the closest we get to that is the 
um, microbial source tracking analysis that um, that um, Carolina Ka Carolina described to you, looking at um, sources of um, nutrients and fecal contamination in catchments. Um, we do not we do not do um, sort of disease analysis or um, any uh, we don't we don't do that. Do you want to, you have anything to add to that? Yeah. The, the only thing I can tie into that is the prospect of a disease based on something like a pathogen from something like raw sewage, as mentioned earlier. Um, at, currently, we're prototyping the MST microbial source tracking. So depending on the type of microbe, be it bacteria, fungus, potentially virus, something in the future, but at the moment, that's not what we're covering. However, bacteria, bacterial communities are certainly um, <coughs> We're, f we're sort of linking them to sewerage pol and, and pollution sources, which, of course, things like E. coli or Arctobacter have impacts on human health um, and uh, ecological degradation. Hi, Olivia Bailey, also from Arab. Sorry, just to follow on from that question. Um, your source tracking, it, it, is it, does it kind of tell you, it tells you what what the DNA has come from, but does it give you, any, do you do any kind of analysis of kind of where in the catchment it might have come from beyond kind of like, oh, it's human waste or it's um, cattle or pigs? So aside from, um, obviously all of, our, all of our sampling points have got a geographical location associated with them. Um, so by uh, by looking at a, at a sort of catchment level and having more than one site within the catchment um, and some knowledge of infrastructure CSOs and so on within the catchment yes it would it, you would be able to you would be able to identify sources of pollution however that would be um, that would depend on your resolution in terms of the number of samples that you've collected I can give you an example where um, there was a definitive kind of a link back to a specific location. So upstream of the catchment, we found a very low bacterial community signature um, uh, that, that we knew was sort of upstream from a site where a CSO was contributing raw sewage. And then downstream of that site, we knew that that signature had suddenly changed. So the only real contributor based on that region was likely that cause. So that was sort of a deductive reasoning where we said, okay, it was likely that um, it came from that catchment. And then as we went in and sampled from particular points in the CSOs, i.e. the actual raw sewage, we then matched that signature and said, actually it is d definitely coming from that point. We have another question over here. I should probably know the answer to this, but um, two quick questions. One, so where's the most of the interest coming from with this new sort of approach? What's your biggest growing client base, so to speak? You know, where, where's that interest come from? And secondly, what's the level of confidence with taking a sample? So if you took a sample in a river in wherever, how confident are you that that's representative of a species within 10 kilometers from that point, 100 kilometers from that point, how many samples would you have to take to give you enough confidence that that's going to be reasonably accurate? So um, I'll, start with the, I'll start with the last question. So um, a lot of studies have been done to show that eDNA does not travel very far. Um, think of, think of um, the, the way eDNA moves in the environment um, in a very similar way to sort of very fine particulate matter. So not only is the eDNA actually degrading um, relatively quickly based on factors such as the pH of the water, the temperature of the water, degree, uh, degree of solar radiation, um, the eDNA actually does settle in, on the substrate um, relatively quickly and does not um, does not travel does not travel that nearly as far as, as what we initially thought, and this has been this has been um, verified by several recent publications that have been conducted on that. In terms of how accurate the eDNA is, similarly, um, there have been several studies that have been conducted that have um, that validated the results of of eDNA compared to conventional um, survey techniques. 
Um, sorry, the first question. So in client base, it's very, it's very diverse. Um, we are, we, our company is divided up into different sectors. So we have an extractive sector, which has been, um, been there for quite some time. So that is growing very quickly. So they um, dealing with large mining companies. Um, we have an infrastructure sector dealing with um, sort of infrastructure projects, so rail and highway projects. We have the water sector, Carolina. Um, at the moment, um, most of our engagement with the water sector has been in the UK um, with water utilities, but also with, we do a lot of work with the consultancies um, such as Arup, AECOM, um, consultancies that are serving the water sector in the UK as well. And just to add to that, in terms of validation, what you'll want to do is always take replicates so that you have eDNA samples and results to compare to um, within within a catchment. So um, using a practical example too with MST, micro resource tracking, we did uh, five months of consistent sampling um, in the same locations. And what we found was that the bacterial signatures, even though the river's flowing, there were very, very, very consistent throughout the five months, suggesting that those pockets of DNA uh, consistency are repeatable through time. Yeah. Also, just to get back to your, just to the, the um, you were asking how many samples would you need to collect? We do have guidelines. So we do provide guidelines on different water bodies. So in, a, you know, in a lake, for instance, if you had, um, if you had one sample, um, compared to 10 different samples in a water body such as a lake, um, you know, there is going to be a difference in terms of the accuracy and reliability of that, of that data. We do have guidelines that we provide to our clients that will prescribe the minimum um, number of sampling kits um, that you would require per section of river or um, size, of, size of a water body such as a lake or a, or a, a reservoir. Rosemary Campbell from WhatsApp. Um, I was just wondering whether the eDNA um, approach would work in a marine environment, in, um, for instance, on a coral reef or um, maybe in a mango area. Mangroves, sorry, mango, ma mangroves. So I mentioned some of our sectors. I haven't mentioned all of the sectors. Um, I'm sure my colleague Sam back home is, uh, is, is, <laughs> is very grateful that you've asked answer that question because uh, my colleague Sam Stanton runs the uh, marine sector. So yes, this works equally well in the marine environment, um, in freshwater environment. And as I said, we, um, we also do collect soil samples. You can, also, you can also characterize the soil fauna communities. In soil, we look at um, invertebrates, soil invertebrates, so bacteria and, and fungi communities. So yes, this works in this works in the marine environment, and the marine sector is active and growing. Hi, thank you for this presentation. Um, I'm Elena Hurst uh, from a water agency in California. Uh, I was curious. Uh, you said that you detected species. Uh, that were in commercial fish species that were in wastewater. Is there something particular about the samples that you know that they've been from wastewater? I'm, I'm thinking like, how would you tell the difference between that and an invasive species that might have been released into the river? So yes, that's, that's a very good question. There are some, there are some uh, marine fish species, for instance, that we regularly pick up in the, um, in the freshwater environment. Um, and that is, and th those are usually species that are known to be species that are, um, that are, that are species that are consumed um, by people, um, or species that are. Sometimes we'll get species that are used as, as bait, for instance. Um, so we do validate our results. So if we, if we, we do once we've um, produced the results, we do go through the results. And if a species is way out of the range for that species, or for instance, if it is a marine species um, that occurs, that is picked up in the, um, in the freshwater environment, then that data is questioned. And, um, and some of that data, if it's very clearly um, 
an error such as that, um, then, then that, that can actually be removed, it can actually be filtered out. So there is a process of validation and filtering of the data in order to make sure that um, those kinds of, those kinds of um, occurrences are actually filtered out of, filtered out of the data. Um, so, so it's a combination of the validity, 98%, or more certainty that it's there in terms of DNA and sequence uh, load, and also whether or not that species is likely to be there. So for instance, in the UK, if we found elephant DNA, even if the load seemed relatively high, we'd go, there's no way there's an elephant in here, unless there's a zoo or something upstream. So so we, we think both in terms of, we look at it both in terms of um, DNA sequence validation and also just logic um, Alexia okay. from the Danube, can you hear me? Yes, go yeah. ahead. I just wanted to add to this topic um, because we also found 19 fish species in wastewater signals along the Danube River. And we validated because based on the very good knowledge we already have um, for fish communities in the Danube Basin. And uh, so we found that those species are either um, farmed fish or food fish in the Danubian catchment, but not living in the Danubian River Persepolis because the majority indeed was of marine origin and never encountered as a specimen in the Danube by electrofishing or other means of uh, sampling. Um, another another um, potential source of um, contamination is, of course, the diets of seabirds. So the UK being an island, um, we have seabirds all over the all over the place. We have I live um, sort of in the UK, quite far away from the coast, and there's always seagulls, seabirds around. And um, the seabirds being there and defecating in the water would be another source of potential contamination of um, so another way that marine fish DNA could actually um, end up in the um, in the freshwater environment. Two more questions. Really great presentation, you guys. Thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering about a null hypothesis. If we were to ask, is a species truly extinct? And at what point or what uh, sampling cadence would we be confident that a zero um, is reliable? So I can start with that. Um, so depending on the environment, um, but let's stick with water because this is a water conference. The D if, we, if we were to pick up the DNA of an extinct species, first of all, it's unlikely because the DNA, it's an organic material, so it'll degrade fairly, fairly quickly. And within three days to a week, that DNA will denature to the point where it's unrecognizable. So if it were to perhaps be kicked up from uh, sediment or something, that could be a more sort of historic or archeological layer. In w at which point we would probably deduce that that species is probably not present currently. But in, in things like soils, water, marine, air, those would be anything picked up is you know that it's currently present because of the timeline and length that DNA um, is intact. Also just um, if, the, if, if you look at this, look at that question from the perspective of if you were looking for an extinct species uh, or a species which is thought to be extinct, think of um, the, the thylacine, for instance, in, in Australia. That's a species which is one of these, it's regarded as a cryptic species, which it's believed to be extinct. Um, if you look at the IUCN red list, it's, it's believed to be extinct, but it's a species which is occasionally, um, oca occasionally you get reports of people saying they've, they've seen them. Um, as, to, uh, as of yet, unreliable in terms of um, camera traps or, um, you know, there hasn't been good footage, nobody's been able to get good footage of it. Um, but if you were trying to detect a species like that, I think it would be, you would very much have to look at the landscape that, that, that um, where you believe that species might be present. Look at the size of the rivers, look at the number of different rivers and, um, and scope your sampling effort accordingly to cover as much of that habitat um, as, as possible, and of course, um, it, it, you know, if you're only doing a once-off survey, um, as opposed to ongoing, you know, I think you would probably need to do ongoing repeat surveys um, as well. One more question. Yes, there's one left. 
Hi, Olivia Bailey from Arab again. Um, I just had a question about logistics. Um, I think you said your lab was in Guildford in the UK, right? Yes. Um, so I, I, you mentioned many case studies um, from outside the UK, and I just wondered kind of how how long the sample remains viable and how that gets uh, yeah how that gets back to the UK in time. So as my daughters so beautifully explained, there is a, um, a buffer solution that is um, a preservative that is injected into the, um, into the solution, sorry, into the filter once you've done the sampling. Uh, that, preser that preserves the filter for, uh, for, a, number of, for a number of weeks. Um, in the UK, most of our samples are posted back using the mail service um, because it works very well. Um, so most of our clients would do a, a run of a run of um, a run of sur a survey of um, a, a run of different sites, collect those sites and just simply pop them in the mail and 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 it gets there quickly enough. Um, with international samples, we've got a logistics department um, that will not only ensure that the samples get to you. So um, Malawi, for instance, I think I mentioned earlier that we're working with the the government of Malawi. Um, we have the um, logistics department to make sure the, the samples get delivered, but also they have the expertise to make sure that once those samples have been taken, um, they very quickly can be picked up and be delivered by whether it's DHL or whatever courier service it is back to the UK again. They have, I mean, there have been some problems with samples getting stuck in, in places. Um, we are learning. I mean, it's a relatively young company. We're learning the ropes. Um, and we're constantly learning about, you know, certain countries are more difficult, other countries are easier, um, but for the most part, we've, we, we always manage to get the samples back in time and with the DNA still, still intact. If, if there is going to be a delay, um, we would advise that um, the samples be refrigerated uh, until such a time as they are ready to be um, picked up and, and, and um, removed from the country. And depending on the country of origin, we'll also facilitate export permits with you um, and all of the logistics and shipping. I actually call the logistics guy the guru because he's just so good and he single-handedly covers the entire planet. So Morad, shout out. Sure. Um, yeah, and yeah, but we're we're really well connected globally now. All right, I think um, with that. We'll hand it over back to James for the concluding remarks. Thanks for the questions. Great, thank you very much, both of you. I think um, for you know people who've got further questions for for Peter and Carolina, please you know see them at the end of the session and and, and contact them afterwards if need be if you want further information. So, what can we conclude from this? Well, from my side, I think a, a new approach applying this technology in, this, in, in, in a freshwater management approach, um, con using conservation science for clear action um, on something that we can be taught it by two amazing children um, in two minutes is quite astounding. We talk a lot about innovation these days and the need for doing things differently and faster and um, accessing things in a different way. And, here we have a great example of that. Um, I think just taking away a few points on my side, also the fact that there's also a lot of unknowns around this in terms of what else we can do with both the approach but also the samples themselves. One sample can provide huge amounts of data that we can build up over time into a real better understanding uh, on terms of water resource management, human health, species. Um, the fact that it's complementary to existing approaches, so it's not a, a direct replacement. There are, of course, certain things in certain locations that you need to build upon and work with stakeholders and partners who do that. The eBioAtlas project that I mentioned at the beginning, and, and please do take a look at the website on that, that works with local stakeholder groups specifically to decide sampling strategies, location, to get people involved, to talk to local people, to understand exactly what they know of certain species and certain situations in freshwater systems. And that has over 200 partners in over 60 countries. So it's a growing network of capacity, which I think just helps build further uh, information, further knowledge, and enhances that flow of information that we all need from a broader water management perspective. It's quick, as we just saw, we can be taught it pretty quickly. At, you know, 
We'd hoped to have some kits here, but due to logistical issues, unfortunately, that hasn't quite worked out. But the point being that it's quick, we could have gone and done it right now, there and then, down the road, in the water, and sent them off, and we'd be waiting for a sample of results. So I think that's quite breathtaking, actually. It's not necessarily um, going to affect the ecosystem. You don't need to move anything about. It's, it's non-invasive, non-intrusive in that sense. And I think um, certainly is a way of being able to access scientific information, conservation data, species information in a way that is unique and can certainly be used both from an educational perspective but also from a management perspective. And the fact that when you're developing things in countries and development interventions are required to fulfill certain environmental and social management criteria, here's a classic tool that allows you to be able to do that rapidly, to know what's going to be there, the strategies of intervention you need to do to be able to take care of those species, minimize loss, and even maximize the opportunity to enhance species conservation given where we are in global biodiversity situation and the loss, in particular in freshwater species, far more than on terrestrial species. So with that, um, I, I'd like to close the session. I really want to thank Peter and Karenina for your uh, expertise and to our speakers online as well and for, the, for the, those on video, giving us that insight into the application of this on the ground so that it's not just something that's a, it's a lab process, that's the end point, but this is really about connecting with freshwater systems and being able to access that information and using this in an applied way. So thank you very much for that and for your efforts and your time. Thank you for you, the audience, for staying with us this afternoon. And please do share this in terms of technology and application with other people that you know, because I think this, this is still quite nascent. It's still new, but I think if more and more people saw the utility of this approach, this would build up a huge amount of new knowledge and data for us to be able to act upon. So thank you very much, enjoy the rest of your week, and thank you to tech support at the back, thank you.